Hi, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery again, part seven today in this overview of the life and times of Premier Zhou Enlai. We looked at his upbringing in Huai An in Jiangsu province, growing up in a well-off family that had seen better days than his time spent in Tianjin at Nankai Middle School, and later Japan, followed by the May 4th movement, which impacted Zhou and everyone else who later on played a starring role in the establishment of the PRC. From these days in Tianjin, Japan, and then later in France, Zhou Enlai became known throughout the communist movement as someone who knew how to get things done. Because of his ability, charisma, good looks, and people skills, he became a leader and someone universally admired for his ability to organize, lead, teach, and keep cool under sustained pressure. Zhou's education continued on in Europe from 1920 to 1924, and we saw how his abilities to organize and manage affairs in France got noticed, and this led to his appointment at the Wampoa Military Academy, where many of the greatest PLA generals were his students. From there, Joe began his steady ascent up the CCP ladder. We know from this series and from past CHP episodes, 1920 to 1930 in China, it was a dangerous time, and Joe had more than his share of close calls dodging Jiang Kai-shek's secret police. And Jiang drove Zhou Enlai and pretty much whatever was left of the CCP in Shanghai into Mao Zedong's world he was creating at Jingangshan. And from that moment, at the bitter end of 1927, all the way until the day he died, Zhou's life was tied to Mao's. And that, as it turned out in the end... Didn't work out too well for Zhou Enlai. Over the last six episodes, we saw how magnificently, if you'll permit me to use the M word, Zhou performed as a planner, an organizer, a manager of people, a cultivator of relationships, a diplomat, a calmer of waters, always willing to take the middle road for the sake of a greater objective. He was a role model to everyone who knew him. But that Chairman Mao aspect of his life, the things he had to do, perhaps willingly at first, but later on, as we saw last episode, unwillingly, against his conscience, and time and again, Zhou Enlai surrendered to his first impulse, loyalty to Mao. The anti-rightist campaign, the Great Leap Forward, the political destruction of Peng Dehuai, Zhou knew these and many other acts were counterproductive and that they're were other ways to engage the masses and prove the superiority of Marxism. Mao didn't become the thing he became simply because he was talented and charismatic. He had help along the way, mostly from a handful of men. Zhou, of course, was one of them. So was Zhu De, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, Yang Shangkun, Peng Zhan, and, of course, Peng Dehuai. But last episode, he got his for daring to point out an obvious mistake to Mao and call it for what it was. By sacrificing Pung, the others who I just named, they all fell into line and knew what was at stake if they rose up to challenge Mao or even question his wisdom. But the scale of the national suffering was of such a magnitude, unseen in the lifetime of these leaders, that Mao, well, he didn't have to take a walk of shame, but he did have to come out and say, you know, okay, okay, it wasn't such a good idea. And he sort of stepped back and took his lumps to some extent. And from 1962 to 1965, Mao sort of got kicked upstairs. And the country was gradually put back together. We'll look at this period today. This is the last decade of Joe's life. His final 10 years ran from December 1965 to January 1976. Too bad for Joe and Lai that it had to end this way. We see in Joe and Lai, going all the way back to Nankai Middle School, that he had this obvious talent to lead and build consensus. He served China well as the first premier of the state council, taking the lead role in erecting the state council and breathing life into it. He also did an admirable job as China's foreign minister and even earned the admiration of those who were not his friends. In this capacity, he became the face of China to the world. If he had only been left alone, unhindered by Mao and the chairman's power struggles and bad ideas, to guide China to greatness from 1949 to 1976. But that wasn't meant to be. There were always political considerations in following the party line. 
In his remaining years, Joe will watch his comrades, going back to the 20s and 30s, be purged one by one. Only he will survive. Always number three. It wasn't easy. Let's pick up from last time and get the setup for the GPCR, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Now, the Cultural Revolution has been covered before in the eight-part series, CHP 83 to 90, and in the Deng Xiaoping series, CHP 63 to 70. We also discussed the Cultural Revolution in the Boy E. Ball and Sidney Rittenberg episodes. I'll try not to get sucked in too deep here with all the details and minutia of those 10 years from 1966 to 1976. But there's no way to not talk about it, so I'll try and stick to the bullet points. Let's go back to June 1960, when Mao started to back down from his disastrous policies. He instructed many of the top leaders to tour the countryside and investigate the extent of the problems. One of the main policies that was being investigated was the impact of these communal mess halls demanded by Mao versus everyone else making their own three squares a day at home. You know what happens when the kitchen is open all the time. You don't have to pay for anything. People do what people do, and they did it in China too. People ate more than their share, and before long, there wasn't enough left to go around. Nobody liked these communal mess halls, and they were a major contribution to the hunger problem and dissatisfaction among the masses. This whole thing was done away with. After the results of a fact-finding mission, Joe took from Guiyang in Guizhou province to villages in Hebei. On May 3, 1961, he pulled into the Geming Laoqi of Boyan. There's this, there's this film that came out a few years ago. It was called Zhou Enlai, the Suga Zhou Ye. That translates to uh, Zhou Enlai's Four Days and Nights. The English title of the film was called The Story of Zhou Enlai. I'll put a link to that film on my website. You can watch it in its entirety with subtitles on YouTube. It starred Wang Tiechung, who I think holds the record for portrayals of Zhou Enlai in Chinese cinema. It's propaganda of the highest order. But hit me reaching for my hanky a few times. The movie portrays Zhou at his saintly best. But that aside... The film does offer a little bit of historical value. You see, in 1961, in the midst of the famine, when Zhou had traveled all over China to meet with local cadres, no one was willing to speak the truth. That's how bad it was. In this world turned upside down, no one wanted to risk the wrath of the party by speaking up and pointing out the obvious. So in this movie... Zhou meets with the party cadres in Boyan, and at first they just shine him on, saying, yeah, all's fine here, They're, everyone's eating well. But soon the truth is revealed. And after a couple heartfelt talks between Zhou and this old granny who once made noodles for Deng Xiaoping and Liu Bocheng when they passed through the village during the Second Sino-Japanese War, and again during the Civil War, she told the premier what the true story was and that these communal mess halls did more harm than good. And little by little, the premier dragged the truth out of these chunmin and understands the wisdom in their advice. So from this visit, Joe gathered the facts and reported accordingly to Chairman Mao, and from this moment followed the whole readjustment of rural policies, including these unpopular communal mess halls, that of course led to the gradual eradication of hunger in the countryside. 1960 to 1962, Zhou Enlai's main job was to lead the government response to the famine. This meant hands-on involvement, talking to party leaders in the provinces, diverting grain and resources, handling one dire and desperate situation after another. China even had to do the unthinkable and purchase grain from Australia and Canada. Not only were people starving, but coal supplies were low as well. This was the primary source of energy, and the people suffered because of this as well as for lack of food. The energy problem was also handed to Joe to deal with, and he tackled this matter by assigning trusty old Gu Mu to manage the crisis. In the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping will rely strongly on Gu Mu to implement all his new economic policies and experiments. Joe had a lot of great underlings who acted as competent extensions of their boss. Later on, they'll all 
get struggled against when the GPCR hits a fever pitch. By the end of 1961, the agricultural crisis had reached its nadir, and it was looking like a comeback was in the making. Mao continued to lay low and had been forced to say the words he hated most. I made a mistake. Yeah, Mao's brand really took a beating. He had gone and purged Peng De Huai and went after everyone else who thought like Peng. Now, all along, Peng was right. So you can imagine how Mao must have been feeling right about now. He was really going to get spanked badly in January and February 1962 at the 7,000 Cadres Conference. Here in this theatrical performance, arranged and choreographed by Beijing party boss and mayor Peng Chen, Mao was criticized left and right, but no criticism came from Zhou. After everyone had their chance to point their finger at Mao, Zhou stood before everyone and took Mao's whole bad idea and claimed ownership of it. He heaped blame on himself for getting Mao all wrong, and because of this, the mistakes of the Great Leap were made by himself and not by the chairman. Well, Lin Biao went and did the same thing. Mao had gone and made Lin the successor to Peng Dehuai as defense minister. And for this, Lin Biao is going to take the glorification and deification of Mao to heights no one else, not even Mao himself, could do. And he gave a superb performance at the 7,000 Cadres Conference. While Peng Zhen gave everyone a forum to criticize the Great Leap, i.e. Mao, Zhou Enlai and Lin Biao countered all the negative, though for different reasons. In 1961-62, Zhou once again tried to improve the lot of intellectuals and the role they should play in China. Just as it started to gather some momentum, there was rather harsh pushback from the leftists. Mao had granted Zhou this authority, but when the premier went for help in defending against attacks from the left, Mao decided to look the other way. He might have felt one way a few months before, but once again, Mao retreated from this and showed his true colors, and that was being one himself. He just couldn't trust these intellectuals in society. July 1962, the Sino-Soviet split was in the midst of happening. There were minor clashes in Xinjiang and Soviet support for India against China in the border war of October of that year. And I suppose as China's premier, you could say Joe had a hand in everything, but as far as the Sino-Indian war went, he really got involved. He had by now this very strained relationship with Nehru. In the 1950s, they were BFFs. The whole McMahon line thing where the borders between India and China had been hastily drawn were swept under the rug. Now the rug had been pulled away and Nehru decided in 1962 that it was time to take back this Indian territory from China. Joe believed this was going to be a terrible mistake for Nehru and he tried very hard to reason with the Indian leader. But Nehru had had enough of Joe and saw in him... Someone who was silver-tongued but totally untrustworthy. Despite Joe's warnings, Nehru went ahead and invaded, and on October 21st, the Chinese army counterattacked, and over a two-week period, just completely overwhelmed and defeated the unprepared but extremely brave Indian army. Then Joe did a little of his magic on November 11th and called for the PLA to unilaterally withdraw behind the McMahon line. He made sure all captured weapons were returned to India, all Indian soldiers who were KIA were buried with military honors, and 3,000 POWs, including officers, were returned to India. And, of course, word got out about what Joe had gone and done, and Nehru looked like a jackass and never recovered from this whole mistake of October 1962. And as bad as Nehru ended up looking... That's how good Zhou Enlai and the country he represented looked in front of the whole world, or at least to those paying attention to this conflict. Zhou couldn't have looked more magnanimous in victory. As far as Khrushchev and the Soviet Union were concerned, the long slide downhill was still going on. Mao and Khrushchev, who he called the chieftain of modern revisionism, feuded openly. And there was no love lost between these two. 
very heated exchanges took place. In the good old days, when Russia acted as China's laokuka, were long gone. On top of the red-hot, fiery diplomatic exchanges between China and the Soviet leaders, Khrushchev also went on the offensive internationally, calling on all these same non-aligned nations that Joe had targeted. From the end of 1963 and into 1964, Joe will launch his own international charm offensive to counter this Soviet attempt at diplomatically isolating China. Did I mention Chairman Mao put Zhou Enlai in charge of China's program to build an atomic bomb? Now, Zhou was, of course, heavily involved, but he had delegated his best man, Deng Xiaoping, to handle the day-to-day project management with Purdue University educated scientist Deng Jiaxian. In July 1955, Zhou had invited two experts, Li Guang and Qian Sanqiang, to his Zhongnanhai office to discuss the feasibility of China going it alone on the matter of developing nuclear weapons. Remember, the Soviets wouldn't help them out. After listening to these two brilliant scientists and reporting his positive findings with Mao, the chairman gave the go-ahead to develop atomic power, specifically a bomb. So Joe became sort of the General Leslie Groves of this Chinese version of the Manhattan Project, or Project 596, as they called it. And Joe, in his capacity as the top guy in the whole state council, was able to rally to the cause 20 ministries, 20 provinces, and 900 factories, research institutions, and universities. In November of 1962, work began. While the country was still technically suffering from the famine, a nuclear testing facility was set up in the town of Lo Pu Po, a.k.a. Lop Nor, in Xinjiang province. Work proceeded at a quick pace, and by January 1964, Joe was informed that enough enriched uranium had been achieved, and they were almost ready. On April 11th, 1964, Joe began discussing an actual test date. And looking at the situation and what was ready to go, it was decided October 1964 would be the testing window. Then, on October 15, 1964, Nikita Khrushchev was overthrown in a coup and replaced by Leonid Brezhnev. The very next day, China tested its first atomic bomb, and it was a success. You can't imagine the surge of optimism that permeated Zhongnanhai at this time. The despised Khrushchev, who had mocked and derided Mao and openly disrespected him, was gone, just like that rather unexpectedly. And then the very next day, after hearing such fantastic news, China blows off their first bomb. What a joyous occasion. Zhou, of course, gave full credit to Chairman Mao. I'm quoting from Han Su Yin's book again about what French Prime Minister Georges Pompidou wrote following the A-bomb test. Quote, Immediately, China's situation in the world was changed. Now there was talk of her being seated at the United Nations for her participation at such and such a conference. The moment approaches when the United States will have to recognize the People's Republic of China. End quote. In the ebullient afterglow of Khrushchev's overthrow, Mao sent Zhou Enlai to Moscow to go feel out Brezhnev and Alexei Kosygin and see what their thoughts were with regard to Sino-Soviet relations. The hope was that Leonid Brezhnev would be someone China could get along with better. Well, that little get-together didn't go too well for Joe. He went to Moscow with Hulong to attend this event, the 47th anniversary of the October Revolution. Basically, after all the talks, the end result was that there weren't going to be any changes with respect to Soviet attitudes and foreign policy towards China. In other words, although Khrushchev wasn't around anymore, his China policy was. That wasn't bad enough. At one of the receptions, Joe sat next to the defense minister, Rodion Malinovsky, one of the heroes of the Battle of Stalingrad. Malinovsky, I don't know, maybe he had one vodka too many. He was a military man more than a diplomat. He made a remark to Joe openly in front of everyone standing around that it sure would be a good thing for Sino-Soviet relations if Mao wasn't around. (laughs) Yeah, and then he followed that up with saying, quote, we Russians got rid of Khrushchev, and you should do the same thing with Mao, end quote. 
Well, even if Malinovsky thought that way, the minister of a foreign country, let alone the defense minister, shouldn't say to the head of a sovereign state, hey, you guys should overthrow your leader. So Joe got up, registered the strongest possible protest, and stormed out of the hall. Hulong was right there, and he just laid into Malinovsky and gave him a piece of his mind. The press were gathered round and caught the whole thing. The news went out on the wires that the Soviets and Chinese had come to some kind of understanding whereby Mao was going to step down and Joe would become the new chairman. This was a potentially explosive situation. But actually, when you look at his whole life, Zhou Enlai always knew what to do in these kinds of situations. He issued a quick public denial of the statements made by Defense Minister Malinovsky. Bombs this big needed to be diffused at once. No waiting. He left Moscow early, got on a plane, and headed back to Beijing. And when he landed at Capitol Airport, guess who was there to greet him? With a bouquet. Yeah, Chairman Mao himself. Let me tell you, Mao never did that for anyone. So with that, this potential tempest didn't even make it to the inside of the teapot. No harm, no fall. Also happening against the backdrop of everything I mentioned so far is the Vietnam War. Yeah, that's also starting to percolate, and this too was Joe's headache. He had a very close personal relationship with Ho Chi Minh going back to his Paris days in the early 20s. The French were gone, with China's help, if we remember from a past episode, and now it's Uncle Sam's turn to go in and prop up that government of Ngo Dinh Dim. By 1961, LBJ was calling Ngo the Churchill of Asia. So, you know what Zhou Enlai had to be thinking this early in the game. By 1962, the U.S. Air Force was already spraying Agent Orange over the forests of North Vietnam, and a year later, in 1963, Buddhist monks were setting themselves on fire in the streets of Saigon, and President Ngo and Kennedy will be assassinated. These were pretty significant events and greatly impacted Joe's management of the Vietnam situation. So Joe and Lai knew the U.S. was fixing to stay a while down in Vietnam. So once this became obvious, he met with Pham Van Dong in Guangzhou and well, didn't exactly give him a blank check, but he said... China would pick up a lot of the expenses to arm 230 infantry battalions, which was certainly a better deal than Stalin ever offered to China. Joe assured the leaders of North Vietnam, as well as Laos and Cambodia, the U.S. was getting into a war they could not win, and to expect that this might last five years or more. And most important of all, China stood behind them no matter what. The U.S., could not be allowed to succeed in quelling the Vietnamese communists and setting up a puppet regime there. Joe didn't want to see this in the Northeast during the Korean conflict and not now in the South along the Yunnan-Guangxi border. After the Gulf of Tonkin incident on August 2nd and 3rd, 1964, Joe called for mass protests in China to vent against the U.S. Over 20 million people were mobilized in a short time to take to the streets in February 1965, they squeezed one and a half million people in Tiananmen Square to protest the American imperialists. Despite all this, Joe still had his backdoor channels with the U.S. government. At this time, 1964-65, Pakistani President Ayub Khan was the go-to guy to pass messages back and forth to the U.S. Joe used President Khan to warn the U.S. that China wasn't going to do anything to provoke a war. But the same deal with the Korean War would be applied here. If the U.S. goes into Vietnam and starts something, China is going to come in with a vengeance. Throughout 1965, with Operation Rolling Thunder going on, American combat troops landing at Da Nang, and with more than 200,000 on the way by year's end, Zhou Enlai concluded... The U.S. was acting aggressively enough, whereby he swung into action. And being the essential guy at the center of things in the government, Joe did everything in his formidable power to gear China up for this Vietnam War with the U.S. Organs were set up inside the government specifically to deal with all the aid and support required by the North Vietnamese. Already, China had given their all to aid the cause of the North Vietnamese with the building of the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail. This road stretched from Yunnan province 
all the way down to South Vietnam. It was the Burma Road of the Viet Cong. Supplies, food, ammo, and everything else requested by the Viet Cong that China could provide was sent down this path. The Americans bombed it mercilessly. The Chinese had troops and engineers working alongside the Vietnamese doing all kinds of civil construction work. And sure enough, every now and then, the U.S. Air Force would encroach on Chinese airspace and would be met with stiff resistance. Once again, U.S.-China relations was having a bit of a rough ride. Prior to all this, back in December 1963, Joe went on a 75-day grand tour of Asia and Africa. The worst of the Great Leap and famine was over, and it was time to go hit the road again and repair all the foreign policy damage brought on by those four years of upheaval. The foreign minister was now Chan Yi, but this trip was meant to be very high profile, and Joe accompanied Chan Yi to add to the star power. For the rest of December 1963 to February 1964, when you know who were playing the Ed Sullivan show, Joe went to Egypt. Algeria, Morocco, Albania, Tunisia, Ghana, Mali, Guinea, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, Burma, and Pakistan. It didn't go so smooth at every stop. In Cairo, for example, Nasser gave Joe the cold shoulder. He was deep in the Soviet's pocket in 1963 and didn't want to be seen rubbing elbows with China's premier. So not much was accomplished, much to... Joe's chagrin, he was counting on good relations with Gamal Abdel Nasser and was hoping he'd be an ally, but Brezhnev got to him first. In Algeria, Joe was trying to muster up a follow-up conference to Bandong as a means to counter growing Soviet influence. The whole thing never got off the ground and was seen as a major political embarrassment to China and certainly to Joe and Lai. When his plane touched down in Ghana, there was political unrest. In Khartoum, Joe had thanked his host for killing General Charles Chinese Gordon in 1885, a man who had so much Chinese blood on his hands. Joe reached out in 1962 with a similar charm offensive targeting the overseas Chinese. They had mixed feelings about Joe, but he knew of their importance and did what he could to court their support of China. These overseas trips didn't go as smoothly as Joe had hoped, but he still got out there and flew the flag and did all the necessary work that needed to be done to build and strengthen China's foreign relations, which in the 1960s wasn't the easiest job in the world. When Zhou Enlai and Chen Yi got back to Beijing, they found some factions were pointing fingers at them and criticizing them for some of the things they said and for some of the failures of the mission. Liu Shaoqi, for one, made his dissatisfaction known. Now, in between the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution was another one of Mao's brainstorms. And anyone in a big company knows when the boss calls a meeting and is jonesing about an idea or pet project. And so it was with Mao's third front movement, known in Chinese as the San Xian Jian Shi. This is a big topic that's sort of an episode in its own right, so I won't get bogged down in the details and what merits came out of this, except to mention that it was added also to Joe's plate. So you can see, 1964 was a, was a hell of a year for Joe and Lai. Now, the third front really became a thing for Mao in 1964, right after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution when the U.S. military showed their hand. Mao's worry was that too many strategic national assets were clustered close to the East Coast. All the major population centers, now with nuclear bombs and missile technology already starting to really ramp up with the U.S.-Soviet space race, Mao said you got to get these basic industries far away from these vulnerable locations close to the eastern seaboard. The Third Front was, of course, in the provinces that were farthest from the coast which made them the most backward and poorest, at least back then. Qinghai, Ningxia, Yunnan, Guizhou, Sichuan, Gansu. So once again, Chen Yun, Bo Yibo, Li Fu Chun, and their network of specialists had to redo the third five-year plan. With this third five-year plan, these leaders were finally saying, let's take care of the big three first, Chi Chuan Yong. Food, clothing, and 
BLPing stuff you needed every day, daily use articles. Get these basic necessities of life finally out into the market. Mao, of course, had other ideas. The third five-year plan put heavy industry at the bottom priority. So now Mao called for heavy industry to become the top priority. And the name of the game was to build an entirely new heavy industrial base in these far and distant places. And remember, China's transport network in 1964, 1965 was not like it is today in China 2016. It was a monumental waste at a time when the toxic cleanup from the last bad idea had only just been completed. But Mao felt an attack from Russia or the U.S. was never more possible than at the present time, and this whole third front thing needed to happen for the sake of the nation's defense. So any major state-owned enterprise that was considered too important to be bombed were moved out to this third front in the northwest and southwest of China. People would have to wait a little bit longer for these new clothes and new young pin. Now, what is Joe's role in this? He didn't personally manage the whole affair. He had Li Fu Chun and others to handle that. But when Chairman Mao wanted to know at four in the morning what was up with the Third Front movement, he called Joe. He didn't call those guys. So this whole Third Front movement... He had to squeeze this one in along with performing CPR on the country after the Great Leap Forward and the subsequent famine, managing the development of the atomic bomb, working with Chun Yi on foreign policy, dealing with the rapidly escalating Vietnam War, and managing all the ministers under the state council. Not many people know this story, but in addition to dealing with all these very grave and serious responsibilities, Joe also, in 1964 acted in the role of impresario for a stage production called March Forward Under the Banner of Mao Zedong Thought. From the title, you can guess what it's all about. It was sort of like a four-hour-long greatest hits of all China's best revolutionary songs going back to the 1940s. This had a cast of 2,000 and played night after night to the masses. It later was turned into a movie called The East is Red, Dong Fang Hong, Joe got involved in every detail, from the production, writing, directing, down to the scenery and makeup. It was one big, fat glorification of Chairman Mao, and wasn't any different from the kind of nauseating, staged rallies Lin Biao used to arrange to Mao's glory. You see, there's a very strong argument out there saying the bad Mao, as opposed to the good Mao, was a creation of men like Zhou, Lin Biao, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, and others who made him a law unto himself, completely unassailable. Then, when the Cultural Revolution came around and Red Guards in 1967 to 1968 were all over the place, smashing things up, they realized only too late the error of their ways. On May 14, 1965, China tested another atomic bomb. As this was happening, Mao was busy planning the Cultural Revolution. 1965, 1966, Mao was talking plenty about exporting revolution and supporting revolutionary causes elsewhere. There was the unsuccessful coup attempt in Indonesia, October 1965. The communist KPI suffered a horrifying setback. For this, too, Zhou Enlai got an airful from Liu Shaoqi about being responsible for this debacle. Yeah, end of 1965, you could tell something was going on with Liu Shaoqi, president, state chairman, and vice chairman of the party. If Liu had any thoughts about moving in on Chairman Mao and relieving him of some of his power, there was no better time than the present. 1964, 1965, Mao was still laying low and carping about being treated like a dead ancestor. He sat there and stewed over all his comrades and their seeming backsliding on their revolutionary spirit and resorting to capitalist measures to solve problems. Well, Joe didn't plot the Cultural Revolution with Mao. He was a tool of Mao, manipulated into carrying out his end of Mao's plan. He didn't know the big picture in the beginning when Mao was setting everything up. When it's all over, 1976... Joe would be the one and only top leader who survived the Cultural Revolution without being purged.
But that didn't mean he had it easy. His well-known role during the Cultural Revolution was to, firstly, carry out Mao's orders. But at the same time, don't allow the country to go down the toilet. He had to wave that little red book as much as everyone else, but he also had to keep a lid on the worst excesses. There are many stories of people he saved. I'll get to a few in a moment. But most of the time, he had to remain silent and stone-faced when some of the worst atrocities were committed. The story is, of course, very well known. Mao went after Peng Jun first. And he was able to bring a super heavyweight like Peng Jun down by first attacking the Beijing literary establishment. And if you recall from those past episodes, Mao used his wife, Jiang Qing, to lead the attack. Over the past 30 years, going back to the Yan'an period, this woman had built up quite a long list of grudges. There were so many scores to settle and people she was itching to get even with. First, she went after Beijing vice mayor and Ming dynasty expert Wu Han by pointing to the play he wrote in 1961, Hai Rui Dismissed from Office. This was a play about something that happened in the Ming dynasty, but Jiang Qing insisted it was an allegory for Mao's dismissal of Peng De Huai. It probably was. Peng Zhen refused to print this highly inflammatory essay written by Yao Wenyuan at Mao's behest. Yao was later part of the Gang of Four. Now, Yao Wenyuan wrote the article, but believe me when I say it went through several drafts, all of which had Mao's edits in the margins. The article ran in the Shanghai Wenhui Bao, but Mao also wanted this criticism of Wuhan's play printed in the Beijing papers. Peng was not doing it. Finally, after the ground started to shake from Mao's anger and everyone saw what was happening, Zhou Enlai had to step in and tell Peng Jun, better print that article. You have no choice. Not much of a choice for Peng Jun. If he printed the article, he was committing political suicide. If he chose not to print it, he was openly defying Mao. Nobody so far had gone and done the latter and lived to tell about it. So Peng printed it, but had it buried inside the People's Daily as an academic matter, which was not as serious as a political matter, which would have gone on the front page. That wasn't what Mao wanted. This was a front page matter. No heads were rolling yet, but everyone knew something was up. Mao hadn't been residing in Beijing for a while. He had gone and disappeared to the south, Shanghai, Wuhan, and Hangzhou mostly. He was always on the move, staying out of sight, freaking everyone out, no less, with his extended absence. The attack against Wuhan and Peng Chen was just his opening move. The ultimate target was Liu Shaoqi, but Mao had to get rid of Liu's men first. One way Mao was able to get around the system was to issue these central directives, or Zhong Fa. Zhong means center, Fa means to issue. This was like an executive order, but... Unlike when the President of the United States does this, Mao didn't have any pesky congressmen pushing back and saying he couldn't do that. This was how he went and did things during the Cultural Revolution. He kept issuing these Zhongfas that no one could do anything about. First, he issued a Zhongfa to get rid of Yang Shangkun, who headed the central office. Yang was an ally of Liu Shaoqi, so he had to go. Same with Luo Ching. Luo was a direct competitor of Lin Biao. Mao and Lin put their wives to good use. Mao used Jiang Qing to get rid of Peng Zhen and Wuhan, and for Luo Rei Qing, Lin Biao used his wife, Ye Chun. Now, Jiang Qing gets all the glory of being the most insidious, bloodthirsty character of the Cultural Revolution, but Lin Biao's wife, Ye Chun, was a very close second. She had a colonel's rank in the military, but her husband was the defense minister, so she probably didn't have to work too hard to achieve that high ranking. Ye Chun took Luo Rei Qing down by going after his subordinate, Xiao Xiangrong. This was meant to provoke Luo, which of course it did, and before long, simple-minded Luo Rei Qing got tangled up in the mess, and as it so often happened during the worst years of the GPCR, Zhou got called in to lead him, and later many others, to the executioner's ground. December 11, 1965, Zhou told Law to get down to Shanghai for a meeting. When he arrived, Law was 
met by Joe and Dung, who told him what was up. They let him know he was in trouble and not to dare try calling Mao or Lin Biao. Law was not a politician. He was a military man, and his record and list of achievements was admirable. Mao really hated to destroy him, but Lin Biao wanted this guy out. In fact, all these top-ranking military men, Lin knew they weren't going to side with him, so he needed to get rid of them. At this meeting, Luo Rei Ching was taken down hard. You know how they do it. These purges are all the same. Luo tried in vain to defend himself. His old comrades, Zhou Enlai, Liu Xiaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, Zhu De, these guys are, are criticized for their lack of backbone and their failure to collectively stand up to Mao. And like I said, the charges against Luo were all being made by Ye Chun, Lin's wife, a colonel destroying a general, and a long marcher at that. But in order to enhance Lin Biao's position and power in the military, Luo had to go. Mao reluctantly gave the okay. Lin Biao's ongoing support was important to Mao, for now at least. So those leaders, they could have stood up and said to Mao, this was not only a bunch of BS, but completely objectionable for the way it was being done, allowing someone the likes of Ye Chun to, to lead the charge. Despite their inner outrage, they just sat back and watched it happen. Maybe this could have been the time. The time Mao could have been stopped. But they all looked down at their shoes and didn't challenge Mao Zedong. So this silence was Mao's blank check to keep on going. So they let this happen, and then pretty much after that, there was no stopping Chairman Mao. On March 18th, 1966, Law attempted to commit suicide by jumping off the roof of his house, which, in the CCP way of looking at things, was a bold-faced admission of guilt. So Law Rei Ching, arrival to Lin Piao, he was out. Peng Zhan, arrival to Mao, he was out too. By April 1966, everyone knew which way the wind was blowing, and it was time to start getting on board that Mao train and to try and cover up for any past displays of diminished enthusiasm for whatever Mao had called for. The lead-up to Phase 1 of the Cultural Revolution saw the rise of the Central Cultural Revolution Group, or CCRG, and other leftists taking over in the Politburo. The CCRG reported directly to the Standing Committee, but they were Mao's chief political power tool. Mao had two main levers of power. One was the Cultural Revolution Group. They managed the Cultural Revolution. Then there was the Party Center that controlled day-to-day -day affairs of the party. Then came the 50 days between June and August. This is all in 1966. By this time... U.S. B-52s were carpet bombing in North Vietnam, and the anti-war forces were starting to stand up. The Vietnam War and the ongoing aid and support for the North Vietnamese military was something Joe had to deal with on a daily basis, while all these seismic political matters were going on. When Mao told the students they should rebel and all hell broke loose, you might remember from past episodes, it was Joe and Lai who often had to get personally involved. Many times he got called in as the last resort to face down the hotheads and belligerent forces with an axe to grind about something or other. Talk about walking a fine line. Joe had to know how to talk the talk and appease the leftists, but at the same time keep the increasingly dysfunctional state chugging along in at least a diminished condition. Joe knew better than to not take these students and radicals seriously. Between the end of April 1966 and the end of the year, Joe had to referee 40 meetings between feuding Red Guard factions. It's hard to imagine the pressure the premier was feeling. Every word he uttered being analyzed or later possibly used against him. It was a very precarious path trying to take the middle course. And Joe was under constant threat of attack for his less than tepid support for the leftists' more outrageous demands. It was an endless task for Joe to keep his finger on the pulse of all these Red Guard factions, differing ideologies. If Joe and Lai had not been in the center of things, pushing back, 
sometimes having to outquote some Red Guard leader with regard to what Chairman Mao said, civil order would have broken down. That's a major reason why Mao kept an eye on Zhou and made sure, as long as Zhou towed the line, he'd be protected. Mao knew what he was doing with this upheaval he was creating. Zhou's role in the grand scheme of things was to keep the country going. Zhou personally showed up at all these different revolutionary meetings at campuses and workplaces. He had to stand up with his little red book in hand and encourage all the revolutionary fervor. And at the same time, he had to preach, usually in vain, for nonviolence and for the Red Guards to use words rather than physical force in their struggles with these enemies of the Cultural Revolution. And when Mao welcomed all Red Guards to come visit him in Beijing, when all the rallies were happening, someone had to arrange for all the transport for millions of -of out-of-towners as well as for three squares a day and a place for everyone to flop. These and other kinds of gargantuan ad hoc responsibilities, they got regularly dumped on Zhou Enlai, as if he didn't already have enough on his plate, not to mention his political and physical survival. If you remember, Mao blew everything up politically and left Liu Shaoqi in charge to clean up the mess with Deng Xiaoping. He made them sweat a little as they remained helpless in their efforts to rein in the chaos. Maybe Mao and Jiang Qing were having a nice laugh over this, watching their political enemies trying to extinguish a house on fire with one single bucket of water. Then in July... 1966, Mao took his famous swim across the Yangtze and started traveling in the direction of Beijing. This kicked off phase two of the GPCR. Then at the famous Rump Central Committee, the 11th plenum of the 8th Central Committee, Liu Shaoqi dropped from number two to number eight in the standings. Zhou Enlai still held strong at his perpetual number three position. Bad news for Zhou, though. Once Mao said bombard the headquarters, pao da si ling bu, and that the economy is of secondary importance to carrying out class struggle and people should create revolution by making revolution, it became really hard to manage the government, let alone a foreign policy. In fact, from about September 1966 to August 1967, Joe pretty much had to let China's foreign relations take care of itself. August 18th and November 26th, you had the six big rallies, and then the unforgettable year of 1967 descended on China. Red Guards were given carte blanche to seize power in their cities and towns. Some of the local people didn't just roll over and die. They stood up to the Red Guards and said, not on my watch. And before you knew it, China descended deeper into chaos. Mao let the destruction go on and didn't rush to tell Lin Biao to tamp it down. Zhou was managing to survive using all the available skills in his makeup. Chun Yi, however, didn't fare so well. And when his time came to face the music, it was Zhou Enlai who had to preside over Chun Yi's humiliation. In August 1966, after the Four Olds campaign was launched, old customs, culture, habits, and ideas were frowned upon. These were the days when the same kind of things the Islamic State is doing in Syria and Iraq and and the Taliban and Afghanistan, where ancient treasures and places of great national heritage were destroyed. Same going on in China. Joe had to jump in here and named various places off-limits to Red Guards, the Forbidden City, Dunhuang Grottoes, and the Terracotta Warriors were among the more famous sites protected. February 11 to 16, 1967, was another one of those chances where Joe could have, perhaps, maybe, might have been able to stop Chairman Mao, but he read the political winds correctly and opted to not side with his oldest and dearest comrades going back to the earliest days. This February countercurrent happened, and all these heroes of the revolution, He Long, Tan Zhanlin, Chen Yi, Ye Jianying, Xu Xiangqian, when they all stood up and spoke from their hearts and vented their outrage at the Central Cultural Revolution group, Joe knew they were dead.
Joe knew how Ma was going to react to these words, said in anger by these most courageous of men. Joe wouldn't do it. Maybe if he did, that might have created a tipping point, and Mao might have backed down. But Mao, through Lin Biao, controlled the PLA. Joe knew how this would play out if he defied Mao. And sure enough, Mao indeed turned his rage on these men for their challenge to his authority. No one had ever done what they did or said the unmentionable things they said. Joe again sided with Mao. All those guys went down hard. 1967, great year for music. Sgt. Pepper's, Magical Mystery Tour, Velvet Underground and Nico, The Doors, Hendrix, Are You Experience? Yeah, great for music. Bad for China. That was when Mao pulled out all the stops, told everyone to go smash things up and take control from whoever was in charge. But by July 1967, Mao gave the okay to Lin Biao to do away with the Red Guards. Their usefulness had already come and gone. They had destroyed or neutralized anyone Mao perceived as a political opponent. But before that fire was put out, there were a lot of close calls and instances when good people were about to get it. And Joe was able to use his wits and his authority to protect them, or in most cases, I guess, diminish their suffering and humiliation, at least to some degree. In the end, sometimes that's all Joe could do. Wang Guangmei, the elegant and attractive wife of Liu Shaoqi, she was the first lady of China. Guess who hated her? Joe protected Wang Guangmei, but she was one day tricked into leaving the protective walls of Zhongnanhai. Someone said her daughter was in some accident, and as soon as she was outside, she was grabbed, and then once Jiang Qing had her, Wang Guangmei had to endure several old-fashioned struggle sessions. Word got back to Joe, and he sent one of his men to negotiate a way out. Joe saved her this time, but being the wife of the number one target of these whole ten years of madness, she had to listen to Joe's advice and just be strong and get through it. Peng De Huai, he had been, for years, sent far away from the center, down to Hunan, where he came from. He had been in disgrace since speaking up at Lushan in 1959. The Red Guards had been itching to get their hands on him, but to no avail. When finally, there was no escaping the wrath of Jiang Qing and the CRG, Peng had to travel to Beijing. The trip to Beijing itself and being manhandled all along the way by Red Guards, caught up in the moment of having such a legendary big fish as Peng De Huai in their hands, in chains no less, was something Peng no doubt feared. If he survived, Peng would have arrived in Beijing, not looking too good. But Zhou stepped in for Peng De Huai and arranged for his transfer to Beijing. Zhou gave three orders on how Peng was to be brought to Beijing, under control of the PLA, not the Red Guards. Joe's orders met resistance all the way, but at least Joe was able to do something in one of the darkest hours of this great Chinese hero. Let me quote from Gao Wen Chen's 2007 book, Zhou Enlai, The Last Perfect Revolutionary. Quote, Years later, Peng's personal aide-de-camp recounted the dramatic impact that Zhou's actions had on the former Minister of Defense in his memoir, Beside Chief Peng. When no one was present, I conveyed to Peng the three instructions that Premier Zhou had issued. For the moment, the chief went completely silent. Then he asked, Really? Yes, I responded. And did he really call me comrade? Peng wanted to know. Yes, yes. He said it twice. Very clearly, I said. Peng put his head in his two hands and turned to the wall. I could see his shoulders tremble with excitement. He only finally turned around after quite a long while. End quote. When it came time for Peng to go through his sessions, even someone as tough as he was, who had suffered challenges and hardships that would break most men, he got savaged. He hung in there until 1972, but Jiang Qing saw to it that he never had a good day. He was another one of her victims. She wanted to get him, and when she was big and powerful enough to do it, she did it. Even Song Ching Ling, 
How much more sacred can you get? The wife of Sun Yat-sen, for crying out loud. Even she had to face some harsh and tense moments. She had snubbed Jiang Qing and had been outspoken about what she thought of this whole cultural revolution thing. So Jiang Qing went after this woman, whose bona fides for loyalty to the country were beyond question. Even she had red guards bust into her house, cut off her hair, and smash things up. Joe got her out of there, brought her to a safe place, and called the authorities in Shanghai and told them to go put her place back in order. There were others. Marshal He Long, another tragic victim. Joe tried to save him, but to no avail. By 1967, 68, Jiang Qing was the height of her power, and Joe practically worked for her. And by now, those two hated each other. Joe had outsmarted her and had used his skills and relationships wisely to always stay one step ahead of Jiang Qing and her various personal agendas. But after Mao had let the CCRG essentially take over the government, she became his boss. Let me tell the story of uh, Sun Weishi, which can maybe illustrate Zhou Enlai's impotence in the face of Mao and Jiang Qing and all these leftist elements who were all lined up against the premier. Sun Wei Shi was the daughter of martyred communist Sun Bing Wen, someone very close to Zhou, who was killed by the KMT back in the bloody year of 1927. Later on, when Sun Wei Shi was 18 years old, she was taken in and adopted by Zhou and Deng Ying Chao and raised as their own daughter. This relationship ultimately brought her to Yan'an in 1938. Sun Wei Shi, what is there to say? She was beautiful and vivacious, a free spirit, and was in love with the theater. She was already a talented actress when she came to Yan'an, 1938. And guess who else was an actress? And not as good-looking and seven years older. Yeah, Jiang Qing. And when a play was produced in Yan'an, and she got the minor role, and Sun Wei Shi got the lead, Jiang Qing never again graced the stage with her presence. From these times in Yan'an, Jiang Qing cultivated a great hatred for Sun. It was intensely jealous of her. Remember a couple episodes ago when Zhou Enlai fell off his horse, broke his arm? I mentioned that was the reason in every photo you always saw Zhou's arm bent, never straight. His injury was attended to in the Soviet Union, and Sun Wei Shi, his adopted daughter, had accompanied him and served as his assistant and later stayed on in Russia and studied at the Stanislavsky Theater. She was fluent in Russian and later on also occasionally served as an interpreter to uh, Zhou Enlai. Well, after liberation, Sun went on to a great career in the Chinese theater. In 1956, she became the head of the Chinese Experimental Theater. Her whole life was dedicated to this art and advancing its development in China. Unfortunately, though, she was not gifted with the longevity to see it through. As you can imagine, things like this were not looked upon kindly during the Cultural Revolution years. So Sun Wei Shi was an easy target, and her turn came in March 1968. Jiang Qing, who waited more than three decades to get even had her arrested. I guess who Jiang Qing called in to sign the arrest warrant. Jiang Qing in 1968 was pretty damn powerful in that year. And she made Zhou, powerless to fight back, sign that paper that delivered his daughter to someone who meant her nothing except harm. And with that, Sun Wei Shi was arrested and taken to a secret prison and basically tortured by Jiang Qing for seven months before she finally died from the ordeal. Joe, of course, demanded answers and rushed to order an autopsy. Jiang Qing had her cremated immediately. So Joe and Lai, yeah, he was number three in the party. Yeah, he was the premier of China. But he wasn't so powerful that he was able to save his own family. Even Sun Wei Shi's ashes were not given to Joe. So that was the story of Sun Wei Shi. It reads like a novel when you... Look at her incredible life, her loves and her passions. The number of tragic stories from the ten years of chaos like Sun Wei Shi's are endless. So as I said earlier, although we can say Joe was the only one of the surviving comrades from the Long March to not get purged during the GPCR, it's not like he had a free ride. 
Well, we are way past stoppage time here in this episode. More next week. The worst is over as far as the cultural revolution is concerned. But there's still a whole lot of fires Premier Joe is going to have to put out before he goes and gets sick. That's all for next time. And Lou over at BabbleCarp.com, a tea lexicon. Once in a while, I try and slide these things past him without him catching it. And once again, he got me. I mentioned last time about the uh, Thai prince wailing on Zhou Enlai at Bandong about China inciting unrest on the Yunnan-Thai border. Pshaw! There's no border between Thailand and China. Chiang Rai is a good 150 miles from Xishuang Banna, but it was around there. Thanks, Lou. I'll get you next time. Okay, that's all I got for you today. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny Los Angeles. We had the hottest February on record. Thank you very much. This so-called rainy season is not turning out like the uh, weatherman said. El who? Take care, everyone, and please, please do consider joining me next time for another, maybe, maybe not, final episode of the Joe and Lai History Podcast.